Welcome back out to the garage, and today we're doing something a little different. And that's because just a few days ago, I managed to pick up this behemoth of an oscilloscope. And I am just way too excited about it to focus on any of my other projects. I gotta dig into this thing first. So we're gonna kinda take a little bit of a tangent and take a look at this thing. This is an HP Model 150A. It is an all-tube dual-trace oscilloscope. But aside from that, I really don't know a whole lot about it. I mean, it's only been here for a day, and I can't keep my hands off of it. So I wanted to bring you guys along on the journey of trying to get this thing cleaned up and running again. So the first step is to try and get this absolutely disgusting case off of it so we can take a look at the inside and see what kind of shape it's in. So let's see if we can slide this thing out and set the case aside for now. All right, there's just four screws on the back, and I think if we take those screws out, we can just slide this whole thing out. So I've already got uh, two of them out, and here are the last two. So that's all four screws out. And let's see if we can just slide this case off. If it's anything like the uh, Model 200 CD oscillator, oh yeah, there it goes. It should just slide right on out. This thing is absolutely epic inside. <laughs> HP made some of the most gorgeous electronics back in the day. This thing is just unbelievably cool. It's a little disgusting and filthy. I mean, there's uh, spider webs and cobwebs on it, and the, the tubes all have a... <laughs> <laughs> several layers of filth on them so I think we're gonna need some serious cleaning up here but it looks totally complete I don't see any missing tubes now one thing I did notice while reading about this on the internet briefly uh, was that these side panels should swing open I saw a really awesome picture of that and I can see a little screw in here that says to open and so if I uh, undo that screw yeah there we go <laughs> Oh, that's so cool. Look at that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to tilt the whole thing over and lay it on its side to, to get in a look at the bottom side of it here. All right, there we go. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Oh, man. All right, so this is the tray that's supposed to slide out. I'm not entirely sure how to get it to slide out, but it doesn't matter because we can get a really good look at it from just the bottom here. And the tubes down here are not covered in filth, thankfully. Uh, and they look just absolutely pristine. Everything in here looks great. It is a little dirty. I can see some cobwebs floating around here. Uh, but other than that, man, it looks really nice inside. I think that this thing's not going to require anything super major to get going. So essentially, all I think this thing needs is a bit of a cleanup, and then we'll just put some power in it and see how it goes. The case is going to need the most work, but I don't think it's going to be too much. So let's get into it. Let's try to get this thing looking good today.
right, we've got it all back together and looking very nice indeed. I am just so happy with how this thing cleaned up. The paint is uh, not my best paint job ever, so uh, I may need to still do a little bit of work on it, but for now that's uh, gonna be okay. Uh, the case is on it because it is almost absolutely necessary to haul this thing around. I got curious how much it weighed and uh, it comes out to 38 kilograms, which is 84 pounds. It's got some serious heft to it. Now in the time lapse there you saw that there was a lot of work that went into trying to get this thing to breathe back to life. Uh, I, I took all the tubes out one by one, cleaned them off, cleaned the board off with a brush, uh, put all the tubes back in, everything was reseated nicely, uh, but there was about four tubes that looked like they had gone to air. So of those four tubes, three of them I could replace, but the fourth tube was one that I didn't have, and that was uh, this tube right here. This is a 6A in Eight. It is a triode pentode and it's a fairly rare tube of the uh, multiple thousand tubes that I have in my collection. I didn't have another one of these. So instead I retrofitted a 6CG8 to fit into the socket. Now I chose the 6CG8 for a very specific reason. It is also a triode pentode, but the 6CG8 is almost identical as far as the pinout goes. On the triode side, just two of the pins are switched and on the pinto side, just two of the pins are switched. Other than that, it's split up really closely. Right, so this is editing David, and I'm gonna jump in right quick. Uh, I just now realized while editing this video up that the 6CG8 has a shared cathode between the triode and the pentode, and the 6AN8 does not. As soon as I noticed this, I frantically pulled out the schematic and went looking through it, and it turns out that these two cathodes probably should not be shared. So I made this really awesome board to convert the 6CG8 over to the 6AN8 plug, but um, the shared cathode means that all of that work was moot. So I'm just going to need to order a new 6AN8. Now, whether or not the shared cathode caused any problems within this dual trace amplifier or you know, further down the line in other parts of the uh, oscilloscope, I'm not entirely sure yet. Although, as you'll see coming up, the oscilloscope is not working fully, so that may be contributing to it. So that'll also take some troubleshooting to see if maybe I can undo any potential damage that I did by doing this. Now that wasn't the only board I made. While I was trying to power it up the first time, I was not seeing any proper power go anywhere. So I thought that maybe one of the electrolytic capacitors was bad. And if I was going to replace one of them, I might as well replace all of them. So I ordered up some uh, new electrolytic capacitors and I traced out how it was point to point wired and I cut up a circuit board that would allow me to solder on the original wires as well as solder in the new capacitor styles, which are uh, much smaller, but they're also a through-hole design as opposed to a point-to-point -point design. And I think it seems to be working pretty well, except that when I got that in and I powered it up for the first time, it still didn't work. It was giving me the same problem. <laughs> and I uh, finally decided to look in the manual and see if this machine was wired up for 120 volts or 200. 40 volts. It shipped wired for 120 volts. But it turns out that the transformers were set up to be wired up in either way. And given that this was used by the FAA depot shops, I thought maybe it's possible that their entire shop was running on 240 and so they wired this up to run at 240 as well. So all of my troubleshooting, putting uh, new capacitors in, and I spent at least two days trying to figure out what was going on, was simply because it was wired up for 240 and I had it plugged into 120. <laughs> now, it wasn't obvious to me because the previous owner had removed the plug on the back. So all I had were three blank wires and I just assumed it was 115 volts because that's, that's what this thing shipped for, but uh, it had been rewired. So after I rewired it, powered it up, it all seemed to work really well. So speaking of powering it up, let's go ahead and flip this on. We can see that the power light has come on. It's got a 30 second uh, power on delay, so that way all of the heaters can get nice and warm before it actually powers on. The kickover relay should kick off after 30 seconds. Yeah, there it went. A nice little click. 
saw a little bit of life on the scope up here, but uh, as you can see, otherwise it's, I, I got nothing on here. And it does have power. I can, uh, you can see I really crank up the scale light here so we can see that. And if I bring the intensity all the way up, we can see that we just get a little dot showing up on the left here. But that doesn't seem right. I've got the intensity maxed. And if I bring the intensity down, it just disappears. Uh, now, if I change it to line uh, for our trigger mode here, we actually do get a line across there. Um, so the CRT is good. We, we know it's good. We saw it working. So the problem is steeped in our horizontal and our vertical amplifiers. Um, so if we turn on our wide range oscillator here, it's going to warm up. And I'll turn on this uh, nice new Siglent scope over here so we can see what our wide range oscillator is putting out. Helps if I plug it in. There we go. All right, so we can see that uh, on our nice scope here, the wide range oscillator is giving us about a uh, five volt peak to peak, one kilohertz sine wave. Uh, but our uh, big HP scope here is not showing anything. Even if I change the uh, sync mode to line, again, we've got nothing showing up here at all. And it doesn't matter what input I plug this into, A or B, we get no change and no combination of switches or buttons will get it to show anything on here. So the vertical amplifier is definitely in trouble. So the first step is going to be getting the vertical amplifier back to life. And so the way we're going to do this, we're going to remove the case, lay the machine on its side. And then I happen to have the schematic for this specific vertical amplifier. So we'll put a sine wave into the input on one side and follow it throughout the amplifier to see where it's getting lost. And maybe if we can find the issue, we can repair it. And then once we have the vertical amplifier going, we'll dive into the horizontal amplifier, which I also happen to have the schematic for as well. These old HP manuals were fantastic with absolutely beautiful schematics that had a ton of information on it. So I am optimistically hopeful that we can get this oscilloscope back up working perfectly. Uh, but it's going to take a little more troubleshooting than we have time to dig into this one. So we'll end this one here and in part two, we'll try to get the amplifiers going and get a proper sine wave showing up here that can help us get our HP collection working correctly. I'm really excited about this, even though it's not working properly now, we've actually got some life coming out of it which makes me super optimistic that we can get it going again. And I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I'm actually really excited about digging through it and trying to troubleshoot the problems. If I plugged it all in and it just worked out of the box, that would have been great, but I don't think it would have been as much fun. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to digging into it. And uh, I hope you guys are going to join me on that journey. But in the meantime, I've got a lot of schematics to read, a lot of manual to look through, so thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next episode.